Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 146 of the Healthy Skin Show. Today we are going to talk all about what you can add to a bath. And this is a bath that's meant to be kind of therapeutic, so to speak, because you've got dry skin, itchy skin, scaly skin, and you're looking for some level of relief. So what can you add to the bath that will actually help you? Some people have talked about bleach baths. I've actually discussed that on skinterrupt.com and other additives that might be beneficial to check out. I've asked a good friend of mine, Krista Bigler, you guys know her, she's been on the show before, to join me and talk all about what she recommends in her clinical practice. We'll dive into that in a moment, but first, I have to give a shout out to one of our listeners. Her name is Grace Irath, and Grace left a five-star review over on iTunes, and I wanted to share with you the impact that this show has had on her and her family. So Grace wrote... I have a one-year-old son who has struggled with eczema since he was two months old. I have committed so, so, so much time over the last 18 months of my life to researching his symptoms and trying to help him heal him without further harming him. We found a specific diet that I fully believed would heal my son, and I dove headfirst into it. It made him worse. I believe it is a wonderful diet for some, but I didn't realize how many factors were involved in skin issues, so assumed one specific diet could fix him. Since finding that healthy skin show, my eyes have been opened to so many other options for his healing and our whole family's overall better health. I love that Jennifer believes in a wide variety diet, and I love that she discusses a wide variety of methods for healing because every person is unique. Eczema is not caused by the same thing in every person. And this podcast has been incredibly encouraging to me, knowing that even though one specific diet did not heal my son, something out there will. Healing is not one size fits all. Thank you, Jennifer, for your hard work and for sharing your knowledge with all of us. I appreciate you. Grace, I appreciate you as well. Thank you so much, first of all, for tuning in and for being such a powerful and passionate advocate for your son. And secondly, thank you for sharing your thoughts and experiences, not just about the Healthy Skin Show, but about your journey and how the show has helped you. Because... I believe one of the worst things that we can do is hoard or hold on to this information. It's been my mission to share everything and anything that I can find that will help each and every one of you. That's my mission. That's my goal. So hats off to Grace and all the other moms and dads and parents and every advocate out there, grandmoms, grandfathers, aunts, uncles, even just friends of the family or boyfriends, husbands, wives, whomever, those who are supporting their loved ones through this journey, my hat goes off to you. So without further ado, let's dive into today's conversation. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I've got a recurring guest. Her name is Krista Bigler. She was on the show a couple months ago, I believe, and um, she's been on the show even before that. So I love that I'm able to have her back talking about a bunch of different topics specifically geared toward people struggling with eczema, especially given that she's got a really great book out. If you guys don't have it, you need to get it. But if you have not heard Krista on the podcast before, she is the host of the Less Stressed Life podcast. And she also has an integrative nutrition practice, a private online practice that focuses on eczema, digestive, autoimmune, hormone, and allergy issues. She started the Less Stressed Life podcast is a play on words for the anti-inflammatory lifestyle, which by the way, guys, I've been a guest on. We'll link that up in the show notes. She lives with her unicycling husband and kids in the Midwest. And she also tries to feed different things to her chickens, which is interesting. <laughs> Love to watch that on Instagram. And you can find all of her resources for eczema, her practice, her podcast over at the lessstressedlife.com. Uh, Krista, thank you so much for being back with us. 
thanks so much for letting me come back and keep talking about all the many aspects we can talk about. <laughs> I, know, I know. So today I figured we'd talk about this because I've never really had a conversation about this before is bath additives. Um, when you're really dealing with skin flares, rashes, etc. I also kind of wonder too, if these may be helpful for people dealing with some other types of rashes as well. The most common type that tends to get recommended in a dermatologist's office are chlorine baths, which take some people back. They're like, what? Chlorine? Bleach baths? What? Um, but you have some personal experience with this. I think that'd be a great place to start. Yeah. Um, because you just teed it up, I'm going to talk, I guess, for a moment about why bleach baths sometimes work. So, and I mean, you don't have to use bleach. You can use something that works kind of like it. So eczema is really hallmarked by an overgrowth or like one of the main thoughts is that, Hey, this is a staphylococcus, a type of bacteria aureus, um, staphylococcus aureus overgrowth on the skin. Like we, we recognize that we see that. So why don't we go ahead and wipe that away and we'll see how that works. So that works in some people and in some people it does not work at all. And I am one of those people. So, and I'm happy to tell you like what kind of skin seems to, yeah. re to respond best to chlorine. Um, it's usually like bright red and angry kind of like, I think that's more infectious type staphylococcus aureus type skin. If it's dry, really dry and flaky already, I don't think that really works. Um, personally, I think that would make it worse. And actually there's pretty good, I have, I have researched to back that up. Um, 2014 journal of dermatology, uh, re chlorine and bathing water, um, which chlorine and bleach are like pretty much mm -hmm. the same thing. I'm not a chemist, but basically th they're essentially like kind of the same thing. Chlorine's a natural element in nature while bleach is a solution of many elements, including chlorine. So I feel like when we see chlorine in water, like in um, pools and other places, I don't know if it's pure chlorine or not. I don't know enough about that. However, we've got chlorine, bleach. I kind of use them interchangeably, honestly. So anyway, 2014 Journal of Dermatology, like chlorine and bathing water, like if it hangs out on you, reduces how your skin holds, holds water in the top mm. layer. So that's actually what a lot of dermatologists say is maybe causing eczema and itching also. So like it's a reduction of water holding capacity in that top layer, stratum corneum. So in, we see this in dry skin in the wintertime. Um, there's a, there's this dry air, um, no, no humidity in the air. So we think that the, the stratum corneum, the top layer of the skin is dried out and we know that chlorine dries it out. So actually, even though dermatologists recommend bleach baths, um, I've been told by this lovely integrative dermatologist, who I believe you've had on the show as well. Uh, I think it's Raja yes. Sivamani. Um, or maybe it was Dr. Peter Leo. Either way, they said, oh, that's more of like a dunk. It's more like a bleach dunk, <laughs> dunk. <laughs> you know, and then you rinse that off. And then, um, in order to seal in moisture, usually you cover the skin right away to seal in moisture. So anyway, I want to mention that. I mean, there's actually like a several, um, studies, all within the last 10 years, 2012 Journal of Environmental Research, they took 350 kids, like little kids, um, and showed that exposure to hard water and swimming um, could increase um, eczema as well. So this could be because it's also compromising um, that barrier. Well, we just talked about that really. But um, it, the thought process with the hard water thing is they think maybe like minerals or detergents or something there in hard water is compromising the, the layer. I don't know that that, that doesn't make sense to me that detergents are in hard water, but again, I don't know. Can, I've had people change. This is a really like, I wouldn't go crazy on this fact, but I think it's interesting to see what works for different people. I had a kiddo whose skin got better just by like changing the water. I think the parents ended up, um, they didn't even use a, a filter. They, I think, boiled the water, let it cool, which will take chlorine out, um, and use that and made a big difference. So you think about this. You consume all this water. Your body is 60% water, but yet it's this silent carrier of mm. stuff. And so sometimes that's impacting us. So I guess I'll go back to my story. Uh, I had some, like, signs that chlorine was was not working kind of earlier in time. Like, it, I was just, I was, like, from my sense of smell, I was kind of sensitive to it if I was around too much. And people can probably resonate with this. Like, if I'm around too strong of chlorine, it, it irritates a lot of people. Their eyes get red, and it's, like, a struggle. Have you ever been, you know, this is the, the worst offenders of this are those hotel yep. swimming pools where people don't probably really pay it. They're just, like, out there dumping in the additives in the pool instead of really following directions, probably. And because you can tell, because it gets, you get those steamy rooms, and everyone's eyes are watering. It's not good. So, anyway, um... 
my eczema took a bad turn for the worse. So I always had this like kind of subclinical got worse sometimes the year or not. I just thought it was part of my life for many, many years as many people do. And then not until it really got awful <laughs> did I really start digging into it really deeply. So I was taking my kids to swimming lessons uh, every day of the week for a full week at a new swimming pool, which may have been a little overzealous with their treatment as well. I'm not sure, you know, it's a possibility. But anyway, so I was there every day. And at the end of that week, my eczema flared with this heck, like hell of mm. vengeance. It was like horrible. And it was that awful eczema where like, uh, it rides with you for a long time. And you know how eczema mm -hmm. is like, what is wrong mm -hmm. with your face? And it hurts and it's like oozing. So it's not good. It presents in certain places. It was like dry. So there was redness and it's really inflamed. And then you could get it calmed down. And then it would be like largely mine was more typical of dry and flaky. Um, so, and there was times, so why wasn't this obvious to me at home, right? Like I didn't have, so about many, many years ago when I moved to the middle of nowhere, um, we got a well. And so I didn't really deal with chlorine anymore. Like that part of my life was really kind of like 90% of the time I wasn't drinking any chlorine in my water and I wasn't bathing in it because I had this lovely water in my well. And I didn't realize like there was a big, so that's why like I really built up this whole thing and had this flare. So why did that happen? I think it, I personally, I mean, I can have my own opinions about my own story and what helped. So <laughs> what helped, it helps me know what the causes were, right? So a lot of liver support, but also that can really disrupt your skin microbiome, right? So chlorine or bleach in the same way, it's killing that Staphylococcus aureus. We have this skin microbiome or this, well, all mm -hmm. this bacteria and whatnot on our skin that we totally don't understand <laughs> very well yet. I really think we're at the very beginning of our understanding of that. And that can really disrupt it as well. So it's great if you have a Staphylococcus aureus overgrowth. If you do not have a Staphylococcus aureus overgrowth, if that is not the cause of your eczema, which by the way, I still think when it's showing up on the outside, like yeah. there's still other stuff that can be going on too. Um, I just feel really strongly about that. Uh, it could... Um, if you don't have a, this red, angry staph overgrowth and that's, I really feel that's how they usually look. Um, and so that's why I'm kind of directing it that way. It doesn't mean that if that's not how your eczema looks, it might not help, but that's just my personal opinion from what I see. Cause I pay a ton of attention to what eczema looks like and, uh, there's, there's patterns here. So if it's more dry flaky, I just really don't think a bleach bath is going to work. Now I mentioned earlier, um, bleach is like just something that just wipes away all, all stuff, right? Just kind of. Right it levels yep. the playing field, just yep. kills everything. So there's other things that can kind of do that as well. Um, I has like, I don't need to really hesitate to say this, but this can be really corrosive <laughs> if done improperly. Um, so especially if you're, we're thinking about a child, I'll usually put like uh, a half a cup to a cup of hydrogen peroxide in a bathtub of water, really no different than, um, than, bleach in the dilution. That's with the same dilution that they recommend for bleach baths. Um, and by the way, that will, that, that can evaporate if it sits there for too long, but I would just test that and make sure it's fine as an adult. Anytime you do anything for a child, someone called me just yesterday and said, can I give this to my, like a family member? And I was like, well, try it on yourself first <laughs> and see, make sure it doesn't burn. Um, so, because you don't know how it's going to be if their skin is a little more inflamed anyway. Um, but that kind of, I, I've been okay with that. If you use kind of a more dilute option, that'll really clear stuff out as well. Um, and it, and I don't think about it as being as corrosive. Now, hydrogen peroxide is really corrosive if you just are skin to skin contact. So as is bleach. <laughs> so the big, big takeaway here is that it's diluted in a bunch of water and it would act. I think it acts really similarly. Sometimes I'll use baking soda, not really the same exact thing, but it's kind of a calming yeah. Yeah. And Anything? what are some um, of the other options that you tend to use at home that people might not even think of to add to the bath? Yeah. So, um, I don't know where I learned this, but one thought school of thought is to kind of rotate different types of baths. So there are antimicrobial baths, like the bleach bath, for example, where you're trying to wipe away overgrowth of overgrowth of staph aureus. There are healing baths. So I'll talk about that in a moment and cleansing baths. So let's just talk about cleansing baths because that's what most people are used to every day. <laughs> um, but we do know that a lot of excess, I know you've talked about this a bunch on your podcast, excess detergent mm -hmm. use can disrupt that skin microbiome as well. And detergents really change. And the whole point of detergent is to pull oils off of the skin, which are going to compromise that skin barrier in someone who's already compromised. So being aware and careful of how you're doing your cleansing baths, there's different things. I'm not like an expert in like, you should use this. I kind of let people decide what they want to use. I mean, 
like pick a really good quality, not non-abrasive irritant. Um, the national eczema, I mean, there's probably lots of people that have different resources. National eczema association does have a list of like, Hey, we approve these products type thing, but you can get pretty simple. I mean, you don't have to look too far to, to, to find some basic stuff. So that's cleansing baths. Um, which I mean, really in a way, if you're doing an antimicrobial bath in a way, it's kind of a cleansing bath, kind of, kind of, but different. So we got our antimicrobial baths, which we just talked about cleansing bath. I'm um, yeah. Cleansing baths, which I feel like you have to kind of choose your own soap or soap thing. Um, and just wash maybe the really dirty mm-hmm. parts and maybe not the other parts. And then the other one is healing baths. Now there is a little bit of research about this. I use this a lot in practice. I tend to stick to, um, dead sea salts or sea salt baths. Um, sometimes like having a little magnesium in there, you absorb that magnesium topically and there's no harm in that. Magnesium is important for like 300 different enzyme processes in the body, um, helps with like nervous system calming. So, I mean, if you've got a kid that's hyper and you just need a break, you, uh, stick them in one of those baths and be like, all right, we're having a spa day now. And (laughs) you are just going to relax (laughs) in this bath. But we do know that dead sea salt solution does seem to, um, what what said indirectly uh, reduce inflammation um, and doesn't irritate the skin. So that is good for dermatitis clients. Um, I tend to do this a few times a week. I do this, sometimes I'll just do a specific area like hands. Um, there are some other options as well. So uh, colloidal oatmeal, which I don't necessarily recommend, but, um, and I think this really varies by by the person. So like either this goes okay or it doesn't. So I think if it's not working, don't feel like you have to continue that because you read that it was good. So colloidal oatmeal powder means like mostly oat starch and a little protein, a little oil. Um, so it improved 29 to uh, like 20 to 30% of active lesions in some kiddos. So, and that happened after one to three weeks of these Mm. baths. So that's a possibility. It's an anti-inflammatory, you know, there's like, it's, um, it's got some flavonoids in it and some alkaloids and some sterols that have this anti-inflammatory and barrier repairing effect. Again, I don't necessarily use them, but I think it's, they're really like you see oat stuff out there for skin a lot, right? Um, what else is used? So we, there's actually, and I think this is more, um, in other cult, other areas of the world, um, rice baths are used. Also, they have some like fatty acids and things in that rice kernel. So that's something that some people use, but the studies are really small. So like in a small study of 13 people using a rice bath twice daily for four days, reduced lesions, after two and so wait, four days. Is this cooked um, rice or raw rice that's puree, like, like powdered? What? what are, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking like a rice great, bath. Great what question. Is this? Great yeah. question. Um, rice starch bath is what it's called. Rice starch bath. That's not something I feel like you really see on the shelf where we live. <laughs> um, what else is about it? There's like a bunch of large words here about fibroblast growth, et cetera. But rice starch, I don't even see that on the – and it talks about it's okay. in more like Japanese okay. culture typically. So I just don't think it's in the research isn't even in the U.S. And, and question for you, uh, do you – what do you what are your feelings on Epsom salt? Do you think that Epsom salt is worth trying or do you think there's a better option? Totally. Okay. Totally. Okay, yeah. I, you, Epsom salt has natural magnesium in it. Um, you can get different salts with different additives. Mm. So I like some with other skin healing, um, additives like, um, MSM and silica. Um, I think like the more skin healing additives I can get through the skin, the better. I really like that. So, um, what else? And then there's bath oils. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think we kind of know this, like using oils afterwards to lock in moisture seems to work well. Um, like, so (laughs) as in all eczema research, this works for some people. And in some people you might have an allergic reaction, (laughs) i.e. in in lanolin. So I, I actually am totally fine. I've never really, I've never had, um, a client with an issue with lanolin, but, um, they talk about how, um, using like mineral oil and lanolin 10 times a day can really reduce visually dry skin. Um, using something with olive oil in the moisturizer was significantly better than using just a moisturizer by itself without an oil in it. So things like that. So what else? Um, magnesium, um, 
what else was I going to say about magnesium? I know it's really absorbed topic, well topically. Um, what other additives are there really? I mean, I personally just use, yes, either Epsom salt baths or Epsom salt baths, like fancy ones that are added, like more added to them. Cause I don't really, I mean, and I might just be like not bath salt smart, but I don't really see a giant difference between Epsom salt and dead sea salt. Like there probably is something. So don't throw tomatoes at me, but like at the end of the day, they feel really similar mm. to me, I guess, because they're both a type of salt. So I could be wrong, but they feel really similar. Now, that's what's in research. I've seen clients use different things. I've had clients living in different parts of the world, and they've brought me back ID like things. So this may or may not be useful for someone, but um, like oozing eczema, I had a little a little baby once and go live with some uh, grandparents and mom in another country. And it was really common there to do stinging nettle baths, which I think is interesting because stinging nettle is an herb used pretty widely in the U.S. to help with allergic mm -hmm. or histamine type reactions. Tricky part about stinging nettle is that it does sting when you, <laughs> when you like a, at first, like it's like a yep. quick sting and then it's like a better. So people will use like compresses and baths and all types of things for that. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting. They use plantain um, leaves and plantain oils, which I think is interesting. I'm really like boring. So I use salts and baking soda cause I think it's fine um, and wonderful. And I'll do some, some like occasionally if I think someone's got staph aureus, I one send them, uh, we work with the dermatologist and to do an antimicrobial bath. Um, and then lastly, just to talk about bleach in general, I have a lot of feelings about bleach. Um, but, and there's some research out there, but there's not a ton. I mean, you can use filters that are supposed to filter bleach. And I, I just don't know about their efficacy, but you see things about there's, I'm just telling you, there's some interesting products out there, like vitamin C filters that are supposed to neutralize chlorine. Um, there's things that people put on before you go into the pool that is, are sold out there. Um, there's charcoal filters that are supposed to be good for it. I mean, I don't need these at home because I don't have chlorine. So I haven't really tested them a bunch, but I kind of give people that information and they kind of do with it as they yeah. please. I want to mention two things. Number one, if people heard you say plantain, they might think the plantains <laughs> are like a cousin of the banana, not that type of plantain. Yeah, it's a plantain pl leaf. It's an herb that actually grows in my backyard. It's considered a weed. <laughs> so it's not the same thing at all. Um, and number <laughs> two, um, oh gosh, what the heck was I going to say? <laughs> totally forget we were talking about planting leaves and yeah i guess that's all i have stinging, stinging nettle. nettle yes stinging, stinging nettle. nettle that's all, always a good option baking soda vitamin c oh, filters yeah, yeah. um the one cool thing and i'll i'll link up uh laura adler's podcast she had shared with me that if you want to know if there's chlorine in your water is to look at your water report go to the water company's website and you can easily pull a report and it'll tell you what additives are put into your water sometimes it's chlorine sometimes it's chloramines which are a totally different beast and she had shared do not get filtered out with those um filters you can buy online or at the grocery store or wherever, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So yeah. you do want to know what's in your water and it's a really easy way. They have to tell you um, what's in your water. So that might also be a good, good thing to consider. Yeah. You so bet. There we go. Look, um, that's a, that's a great, that's a great start. And that's the tricky thing. That's why that's a really yeah. hard topic. Um, and she would be just the best resource because how do you know if that filter actually works? And I mean, I just, because I don't need to buy one, I'm like, well, I'm not going to spend hours yeah. researching yeah. And this. You, and but, you know, the um, other thing to consider too is there's, you know, even with like my water here, I'm outside of Philadelphia, my water reeks of chlorine. Um, now, whether mm -hmm. it's chlorine or chloramine, I don't remember, doesn't matter. And we filter all of our drinking water so that it's palatable. But, you know, you have to also keep in mind that there are unfortunately drug contaminations in the water because people dump their drugs down the, yeah. the toilet and the drain. There's all sorts of stuff in the water that you can't see, smell, maybe taste, who knows. But either way, we think because the water is clear and because it's coming out of the faucet that it's, it's going to be okay and it's not going to cause a problem. And it's not to make you afraid of your water, but I think we have to become more knowledgeable about the fact that there can be things, you know, it's even like mold in the household. Just because you don't see black mold doesn't mean you don't have mold. So just because your water looks okay, tastes okay, doesn't necessarily mean that it couldn't be causing an issue. And it's just an opportunity and invitation to dig a little bit deeper and know that you're not trying to 
turn water specifically or any of these chemicals or any of these particular things it might not work for you as like an enemy against you in your skin it's just like saying hey you know this just doesn't work for me but i think these are this is a really amazing resource and do you t- you talk about these in your book right right krista I can't even remember if they're still in there because I was so many words over. I had to cut some things, but anything I cut okay. out uh, is on the blog now. So it's totally fine. If you, <laughs> <laughs> I do talk about, I do talk about some of it, but again, when you're 10,000 words over, you're going to make true, cuts. True. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I thought I'll just move these to the blog and people can have them. Perfect. At any time. So, so they can go they, to lessstressedlife.com and get access to all mm-hmm. of these resources. And we'll, I'll, um, before this podcast comes out, I'll make sure to link to them in the show notes. That way it's super easy and you guys don't have to search for them. I think that's the best way to go. And, and the book also too, I want to just clarify for people. Yes, it talks about a lot of different facets of eczema, but this is also providing a really practical dietary approach that you and I've talked a lot about over-restriction is a major problem in the skin rash community, especially eczema. So um, can you share with us the name of the book? And it is available everywhere, you guys. But uh, what's the book called so they can find it? The book is called The Eczema Relief Diet, Short-Term Meal Plans to Identify Triggers and Soothe Flare-Ups. And this is like my analogy to this is the... Uh, my sprained ankle theory, which is if you have a sprained or broken ankle and you sit on the couch, you will feel better for a little bit. But there's probably some other things to do, like wrap and cast and elevate, et cetera. So sometimes when people have a short-term success with diet and it doesn't last or they try to do that mm-hmm. for too long, it's like it's sort of like sitting on the couch forever with the ankle. And there's probably a couple facets yeah. there. So just a few extra things to kind of bring in. And so I try to go over all of that, at least in some detail, but we go over the food piece in detail deep detail because people talk about it, but I don't think there's like very clear, let's do this like this. And then if you don't see a result, you know, pivot this way. And if you do still pivot, you know, proceed on. That's awesome. We need it. We need some new game plans at this point, because what we've been doing with diet, and I know we're talking about bath additives today, but everybody's question is, what can I eat? Or what shouldn't I eat? And those are the two questions. And the problem is that a lot of the roadmaps were essentially told to utilize create fear of food, over restriction, nutrient deficiencies at the end of the day, poor food diversity. I mean, it, it really causes a lot more problems than they serve oftentimes. Some people get help, but I'll tell you, my experience, and I'm sure yours is the same, with really uh, chronic cases, food may oftentimes not be enough. And so we have to look to these other pieces of the puzzle. And I love the fact that you're integrating all of that together. It's such a great resource. And I'm, I, I hope that if you, if anyone listening to this has not checked out your book, that they do so. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. That way you can grab a copy of Krista's book. And of course, if you haven't yet, go follow Krista on all of her platforms and also tune into her podcast, Less Stressed Life. I was on there. It was a great episode. Um, and I just, I love having you on the show, Krista. And I'm sure we'll, I'm sure you'll be back again. <laughs> but <laughs> Thanks so much, um, yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, and this, is, this has been great. Thanks. It's my hope that this conversation today will make it easier for you the next time you're trying to figure out what the heck to put in a bath. Now you have some additional options to investigate, to try out, and hopefully something will be a perfect fit for your skin. All of the links and resources that we talked about today can be found over in the show notes at skinterrupt.com forward slash 146. You can also leave questions and comments there so we can keep the conversation going. And of course, I'm going to ask you guys to share, right? I said in the beginning of this that when we hold on or hang on to information, we are doing a disservice to our community. Those of us who are eczema warriors, fellow psoriasis warriors, rosacea warriors, whatever skin issue you have, if this may be helpful to you or to someone you know, please make sure to share this episode. And last but not least take a moment to subscribe to The Healthy Skin Show and then rate and review this show or this particular episode. Doesn't matter to me, whatever may be helpful to somebody out there who's looking for help for their skin, perhaps your words will be the encouragement they need to take a listen and learn. 
I wish you a wonderful rest of your day and I'll see you in the next episode.